I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that the meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance <coughs> with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. It is 6 o'clock. If you would, please stand with me as Mr. Sanders leads us in the invocation and Mr. Kidd leads us with the Pledges of Allegiance. If you would like to please join me in prayer. Most gracious God, creator and ruler of the universe, we give you thanks this day for the men and women who serve our school district and our students. We pray that as they serve, they will make good decisions for the welfare of our students. Guide them to perceive what is right and grant them the courage to pursue it and the will to accomplish it. Give us all hearts of compassion and help us to know with certainty that love is stronger than hate. We pray also this day for the board that we may be led to make wise decisions and right actions for the welfare of our students, teachers, administrators, our staff, and our taxpayers. We especially pray for all who serve in the armed forces, defend them by day and night, strengthen them in their trials, and give them solace and courage as they offer their lives for our freedoms. We also pray for our enemies, lead them and us, away from prejudice and towards truth, and deliver them and us from hatred, cruelty, and revenge. And finally, I ask your blessings on each and every one gathered here tonight. Comfort and keep them and make them ever mindful that you, O oh God, require us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. In your most holy name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor, Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Mr. Sanders and Mr. Kidd. Um, believe because of some traffic jams I think we're going to delay item 2a and go straight to item 2b special district recognition district support staff ambassador awards dr. Stockton okay at this time I'll invite dr. Hines to the podium to introduce our very <laughs> special recipients thank you president husbands members of the board of trustees dr. Stockton our district's mission of educating our students requires the effort of several departments that work tirelessly to support the work of our schools. The Board of Trustees regularly recognizes the outstanding contributions of employees of our district departments through your Ambassador Awards, which honor employees who exemplify excellence and provide exceptional service to the district. <clears throat> it is my privilege to briefly briefly present to you this evening for recognition a few of our wonderful and outstanding team members that add so much value to our organization. As I look at our honorees this evening, the theme is helpfulness. So please allow me to introduce our recipients and they will come up uh, here in the front and join us. And uh, I guess we're going to have a, a presentation of a little bit. Okay. Uh, and so when I call your name, if you'll come up and, and I, uh, and then stay up here. Um, please. First, we, please. First, from the technology department, we have Sherry Nelius. And Sherry has been with the Conroe Independent School District since 1998 and in the technology department since 2003. PEAMS is the state's information management system that collects incredible amounts of data from Texas school districts. Ms. Nelius plays an integral role in our data submissions. As a PEAM services specialist, Sherry communicates with the Texas Education Agency and other Texas districts to ensure that the student information that we maintain and submit to the Texas Education Agency is accurate and complete. Her diligent maintenance of these records contributes to our overall ex excellence and our positive ratings. Next we have from the area of administration, we want to recognize Rhonda Tate. And Rhonda has worked as a legal assistant for the past 17 years 
and is the face and voice of the legal department. Rhonda is always available to help anyone in need, especially department and campus staff struggling with the myriad of issues they encounter each day relating to enrollment, transfer questions, record retention, record collection, custody documents, contract processing, and navigating policies, to name only a few. Because formal complaints are filed in the legal department, Rhonda is the first person that upset people see or talk to when they want to file a complaint. And with great kindness, she guides them through the process, oftentimes providing them counsel and comfort along the way. Rhonda's work ethic, compassion for people, and love of CISD make her an invaluable staff member. Next, we have the Finance Department Ambassador Award recipient, Edie Hart. Edie is an accounts payable clerk. She's dedicated to her job in the district and is willing to go above and beyond to help anyone. She has been with the district 16 years and, is, and has excelled at managing the travel expenses for the entire district <clears throat> and she has streamlined the process single-handedly. As a large district as we are, there are always students and staff members in motion and traveling. This year we moved to electronic approvals for district travel using the requisition within our finance software system. And Edie has been a key player in this transition <laughs> as all district travel flows through her desk. She's created a folder system to track all active travel requests, ensuring that all required documentation has been obtained and payments for registrations, hotels, and meals are processed in time for the employees or the student departure. At certain times during the school year, she could have hundreds of active travels to monitor, and campuses and departments rely on her to answer questions regarding travel. She's done a great job keeping up with the demand in this area and is always willing to go an extra mile to get the job done. Edie Hart is a true asset to the accounts payable and finance departments. From the Human Resources Department, we have Kathleen Crabtree. Kathleen does an outstanding job as a leave specialist in the Department of Human Resources. She's worked for Conroe SD for a total of three years, two of which have been in the Human Resources Department. She is a hardworking employee with outstanding communication skills. She works well with employees who need to be absent for an extended period of time and who need direction and reassurance during their time of need. Her great attention to detail, her follow through and organizational skills have served her well in this position. The department receives many compliments about her work and they are proud that for her to receive this well-deserved ambassador award recognition. Thank you. And last but certainly not least from the curriculum and instruction department, we have Nita <coughs> Lewis. Nita Lewis is a very special member of the curriculum instruction team. She's not only kind and uplifting, but she is great at her job. You also might recognize Nita also sells tickets every Friday night, so we, we see, her, <laughs> see her at the football game. Um, Nita supports the guidance and counseling team whose impact goes far beyond this building. Nita is always willing to help out wherever she's needed working in an office that often deals with distraught parents, school personnel, and community members. She's the voice of kindness and reassurance that those callers need. She has a genuine concern for those she is helping. She has great patience, is always positive, and she has a wonderful sense of humor. And Nita Lewis is a wonderful asset to the entire CNI department. So we have our ambassador awards for this building. <clears throat> I believe Ms. Bush is going to say a few words. Um, we also want to acknowledge all the family members that came out tonight. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all for what you do. Uh, from a district standpoint, you make our jobs seamless, and I really appreciate that. It's been wonderful the past eight months to uh, see just the amazing work that you all put in. So I will, personally from the board, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for all you do. Really Thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
What'd she call you? The uh, oh, That's awful. <laughs> we just heard that there's a number of family members here that are representing these people. Could we ask y'all to stand, especially the grandchildren? <laughs> all stand, please. Thank, thank you for thank you for loaning during the day your wives and your mothers and your dias and your uh, whatevers uh, and uh, we we appreciate each of you. Thank you very much. Go back. Okay, we're gonna go back up to item two A, CISD Education Foundation report, Dr. Stockton. I would like to ask. Uh, uh, Ms. Nelda Blair to come to the podium to give the report for the CIC Education Foundation. We need to do something about that traffic. <laughs> <laughs> That's on the agenda. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, guys. So nice to see you. I turned around. You as well. Hello, Ms. Nelda. Hey. Thank you. I'm sorry you had to go back to my item on the agenda. My name is Nelda Luce Blair, and I'm the chairman of the Conroe ISD Education Foundation. Um, what I gave you just now is our annual report to the board, and I'll give you an opportunity to peruse it whenever you want. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I do want to hit some highlights uh, of it and kind of tell you what we've been doing for the past year. Every year it seems we come and say, gosh, we've done better than last year. Gosh, we've got more scholarships than ever, and I'm here to tell you that uh, we've done it again. <laughs> Um, the front page kind of gives you a synopsis of what's going on this year. And those items that are highlighted in green are the ones that are kind of special items that I want you to take particular note of. Uh, we just finished giving out our scholarships for uh, the end of the school year. Of course, seniors that graduate from uh, all of the Conroe ISD schools are, high schools are eligible to apply for scholarships. And uh, our scholarships we give now are specific named scholarships. So what I mean by that is the foundation itself doesn't give uh, scholarships specifically out of foundation funds. What happens is someone names a scholarship. For example, we have one named after my father, Wimpy Luce, who's deceased. And that fund gives a, schol a scholarship every year. So my family funds that, and that scholarship give, uh, goes out so that it's, it doesn't come from the donated items from the um, Education Foundation. Every one of our student scholarships is like that, and we have quite a few. In fact, we have two new ones this year that people come to us and say we'd like to establish a scholarship in someone's name or in their honor, and uh, that is what funds that scholarship. So that kind of, we administer them, but that bypasses those funds that we raise otherwise and enables us to do other things with those. So, um, we have two new scholarships this year. One of them is the All Means All scholarship that some of you may have heard of. That's the one that Sam Cable has been talking about for many, many years. Well, it is actually coming into fruition. We already have uh, several thousand dollars in funds for that scholarship, and it's going to target specific eighth graders that uh, have some potential for college but no means to go there and follow them all the way through high school and pay for their college when they get out. So it's pretty exciting. It's a pretty extensive program. It's one that we've done differently than we've ever done before. But we're going to take it on, and, um, and Mr. Cable uh, has uh, quite a few people that are interested in donating. So we're happy about that one. Now, what that's allowed us to do is uh, you'll remember, and over the years that I've uh, come to talk to you, that several years ago our board voted that what we really wanted to do was kind of start to turn our boat very slowly to shift more towards teacher scholarships because our student scholarships were kind of covered and then we have all these that are in the names of folks. So um, we have done that. We have every year we've given more and more teacher scholarships and I'm very excited to announce that uh, over the years we've given 219 educator scholarships at 500 apiece and that's since about 2008 when we started doing that. Well, this year our board decided that that's been a very successful program. We've led a lot of teachers to obtain their masters, educators to obtain their masters and uh, their PhDs. And so we increased those scholarships to $1,000 each. And we had more applicants than ever. So as you can see, we gave 66 
$1,000 scholarships to educators, administrators, mostly teachers, but every employee that is degreed in CISD is eligible for a higher education scholarship. And if they qualify and apply, we give it to them. We don't cut off the number. We give it to everyone that applies that's qualified. So that was very exciting for us this year. Those 66 scholarships were overwhelming for us because that was much larger uh, group than we had ever had before. So I can, I'm here to tell you that program is working. And we have repeat uh, people who come back and repeat year after year until they obtain their degree, and we basically help pay for it. So we're real proud of that. We have a welcome back sign-on bonus that you know about. It's really our most popular with the teachers because if you are a graduate of Conroe ISD and you come work here, your first year we give you a $100 MasterCard gift card. And that $100 may not sound like a lot, but it's a big, big deal to a new teacher. So we gave away, uh, we gave out uh, 95 of those this year. I don't have to tell you all that you hire more and more new teachers every year. And quite a few of them are Conroe ISD graduates. We also gave out educator mementos, and I just realized I forgot y'all's. I'll bring them next. I will bring them next board meeting. They're little uh, clips that are uh, in the shapes of apples, and they have our uh, logo on them. It's just kind of as a reminder, a little memento to all the teachers in Conroe ISD. So we gave one to actually Dr. Stockton helped us distribute to every school in the district. Every teacher got one of them to to have in their classroom, and you got one too, but I didn't bring it. So. <laughs> Um, the scholarship breakfast, as you know, that is our, our sole uh, fundraiser every year. We have one large fundraiser. We gather donations throughout the year and we start scholarships in folks' name throughout the year, but that is our one go out and raise funds fundraiser. And I went ahead and put the results from 2007 forward so you can kind of see how every year we've gone up and up and up. And as you will see, we have really outdone this year, $195,000 gross. And uh, we have other, I will say, we have many school districts that we've helped mentor their education foundations, and we're not in competition. So we do everything we can to get them going and to help them. And they always ask us, how can we raise that much money at a breakfast? How can we do that like you do? And we say, well, we have one secret weapon, and his name is Don Stockton, because he is our speaker, and you can't have him. So, so uh, we, we're pretty excited because we're about the only ones that raise that kind of money at a, at a breakfast, but we're very proud that we do it. So over those years that we've raised that money, we give out many, many scholarships, including those teacher scholarships everywhere, and in spite of that, we still have a balance in our CD of over half a million dollars now, and uh, we're uh, climbing as we go, headed toward an endowment. Uh, on your second page, I'm not going through those, but that's for you to take a look at. Those are all the student scholarships we gave out this year. As you can see, each one of those is, an, again, a named scholarship that funds itself. Um, that one in green is the second new one that we had this year. Uh, all those kids um, are, we have actually quite a few more applicants and students than we do give out because they have to follow a very strict application and, uh, and process from a committee that actually goes through and, and uh, checks their, their um, financial need, uh, their desire to, to be teachers or some other type of uh, contributor to education. That's our, our goal is that we're planting seeds um, of knowledge to grow the teaching field. So that's what we still do with the students. So 19 of those. And then that next page and the next page are those 66 educators that got $1,000 scholarships. And if you just take a look at that, you'll see they're from all over the school district. That last page we, uh, we give you because we want you to know that that success of our breakfast uh, is primarily, again, because our speaker is Dr. Stockton on the state of the schools, and everyone in the region wants to hear that. We actually had multiple school districts attend last year and this year, send representatives, because they want to hear what's going on in Conroe ISD. Um, but these are our sponsors for those, and those listed on that last page with the uh, logos are multi-year committed sponsors. And that's only happened in the past couple of years for us that they've come on. And once one did it, everybody wanted to do it. So to have multi-year sponsors really gives us some leverage with others, not only with other sponsors, but it also helps us know kind of what we have going forward every year and helps us plan better. So we're very grateful to them. Any questions? I have one. On these uh, scholarships, if you could, can you tell me what kind of corpus is required? If if there's a, 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 what rate can y'all give? Of it can be per 500 per thousand, just so that 
I'm interested in being able to tell people what they could do in honor or memory or of someone. We, we have almost any type of plan that they want to do, we will do. But in order to do a perpetual scholarship, we're, we're, we're we ask for 15000 which would give a $500 scholarship because we can – now, as you know, you know very well the interest rates right now won't support that, but the the uh, foundation supports it. So if we have a $15,000 scholarship, that's a $500 a year scholarship in perpetuity, a one time for a kid. Um, however, if someone comes to us and says, look, uh, I just want to put my mom this in my mom's obituary, for example, and whoever, whatever much money you give, I want you to give it out, then we do that too. So either way, uh, if they wanted to make it a short term or a long term, we have a couple of them where families contribute every year. They call and say, what's my balance? We tell them, and then they contribute whatever they want us to give out that, that following year or sometimes in excess. So the answer for a perpetual <laughs> is 15000 but, again, we'll do just about anything they want us to do. Thanks. We'll administer it however they want Thanks. us to administer it. Thanks for sure. Thank you, Dr. Stockton. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you for you. having us today. Well, thank, thank I apologize you, you, you don't have your Apple clips because I know you want them tonight. <laughs> now, now that I want to thank you and Maris and, and your board and, and for all, all, uh, all the people that year after year after year commit the, the time and the effort for this. Uh, it's very, as you said, it's very special to our teachers and to our newcomers and to everybody. And it's special to us that we have uh, that we just one more way we can show that we care. And thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. We don't have any of our scholarship winners or teacher scholarship winners here tonight, do we? We do. You. Can you come up? <laughs> come on up, Mr. LeBay. Let me take one extra second because it's always great to kind of put a face with a name for you guys. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. Introduce yourself and uh, tell the board. I'm, uh, I'm A.J. Levecki. I'm an assistant principal, College Park High School, and I'm working on my doctorate. Which is actually why I'm here today. I'm taking notes for one of my classes. <laughs> and my name is Easy Foster. I'm your director of planning and construction here in the admin building for the district. And I'm studying a master's degree in management. Awesome. awesome. Great examples. So thank you, don't you so much. You have to shave your head, though, right? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I should be a prerequisite. <laughs> That's a prerequisite from now. Do we have anybody signed up to her? Yes, we do. Very good. The next 30 minutes have been designated for public <laughs> participation by patrons who have signed up to address the board in accordance with board policy BED. Please remember that the board may not discuss or act on any issues that are not posted on our agenda. The board has adopted complaint policies that are designed to secure at the lowest administrative level a prompt and equitable solution of complaints and concerns. These policies provide that if, in, if a resolution cannot be reached administratively, the person may appeal the administrative decision to the board as a properly posted agenda item. Copies of the district compl district's complaint policies can be found on the district's website. Those who have registered to address the board will be limited to five minutes for their presentation. <laughs> Delegations of five are, uh, must appoint one representative to present their views to the board. Ms. Ferris, please call the first person who has signed up to address the board. Mark McCloy. Dr. Stockton, President Husbands, the rest of the school board. It is my pleasure to introduce the new president to Texas State Education, uh, Texas State Teachers Association, Conroe Local, Cheryl Howe. And I'll let her talk. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, TSDA has had a long and positive working relationship with Conroe ISD and the board members. Uh, I look forward to the continuing this relationship by working with teachers and ESPs and educating them and bringing concerns before you in order to strengthen and help CISD to grow into an even better uh, school district. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Item three um, is the consent agenda. I've heard no uh, request to remove any item from the agenda. So, therefore, uh, I would uh, entertain a motion. Mr. President, I move we approve the consent agenda. And a second? I'll second. Thank you. I have two of those. Uh, all in favor, signify by raising your right hand. All opposed, like sign. And that's, thank you. Item 4A, preliminary, uh, preliminary star 3 through 8, and EOC results for 2014. <coughs> Dr. Stockton. All right, at this time, I'll invite uh, Dr. Gibson and Dr. Null to the podium to present our information. We're excited to share a great story with you tonight on our uh, preliminary star and EOC scores, both in our English and in our Spanish results. Um, a large percentage of our students, as you know, take the star, bless you, the assessment uh, in English and uh, far outpace the state. And you'll see those scores in just a moment. Uh, the preliminary scores uh, for Spanish look a little behind the state. And as we've talked about before, it, it, it deserves a little bit closer inspection. And it really tells a very positive story. Dr. Gibson's going to take some time tonight to go into in depth um, in the to explain those scores. As we've talked about in previous years, we believe it's beneficial for our students to uh, take our, to exit bilingual education as early as possible. Not only are large, a large percent of our students exiting earlier than the state, and you're going to see that, we really believe it's good for the students. We think the, the quicker we get them into English, the better, not only for the short term, but also for the long term. Now, this also leaves a much smaller number of students for us to really target um, for instruction and remediation. Many of these students whom are recent arrival, recent revive, recent arrivals and non-English speakers. And um, we are uh, very um, committed to doing everything we can to help them students be successful. So with that kind of long-winded introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gibson. Thank you, Dr. Stockton. Uh, good evening, Mr. Husbands, President Husbands, board members, and Dr. Stockton. Tonight, Dr. Null and I will present the preliminary star scores for grades three through eight. <clears throat> I do want to remind you that these are preliminary. Usually, there is a one or two point variance that comes in when our final scores come in. Those final scores are expected to come in in July, the end of July, which happens to be next week. <laughs> and then secondly, you're also going to notice that we only have reading scores. <coughs> because mathematics is not counted in the accountability system this year only, one year only. Mm -hmm. And we do have raw scores, but we will know what those raw scores mean in September when we get additional information from the state. So we'll start with third grade reading. And as you can see in our four year longitudinal trend uh, that we picked up two points in English and we are clearly outperforming the state. And in Spanish, and I'm also going to reiterate what Dr. Stockton said and remind you that our bilingual students have an opportunity to test in English or Spanish. So you, you see the results of the students that have tested in Spanish, but you also have to picture that there are stu bilingual students that have taken the test in English and they are in the English scores. As Dr. Stockton said, I'd like to show you just some uh, a long, quick longitudinal trends that we are very proud of. Uh, we set out on our journey in about, this is a 10 year trend, but we set out in 2008 and we introduced a new model. And that model was based on research and was developed for the purpose of moving our students into English as quickly as we could, but also creating a structure and substance so that they are successful long term. So you can see, beginning in 2008, the state pretty much stays the same. And you can see our trend down. We are testing, this is the percent of students that tested in Spanish. We're, we tested about 6%, the state tested about 10%. This is a, this is a very positive trend for us. The flip side, on the English side, and this is a sample third grade, just to show you the patterns, fourth and fifth have very similar patterns, in that um, we are outperforming the state on the percent of students that are testing in, in English uh, by about 10%. And so you ask the question, why? Why is it so important that the students are tested in English? 
It's important because the majority of their education, their formal education, is in English. And mostly for us in our district, our job, especially at the elementary level, is to get our students ready for 7 <coughs> through 12. And that is, we take that very seriously. So this is just a pattern that we'd like you to see. Um, so then you, then you ask, well, how do they do? Once they exit the program, how well do they perform? And what this bar graph illustrates is that our students perform very well. We monitor our bilingual exits for two years. So this is the group of students this year that sat for the test having exited bilingual education and as you can see, we're all uh, very high in the 90% of those students that met the standard. So this was the first year group, and this is the second year group, and you see a very strong similar pattern. Uh, this is, again, key to our success in that, you know, we don't want our kids just to be successful one year. We want them to be successful all the way through, and quite frankly, post-secondary as well. <coughs> The other, the other notion that sometimes is hidden in all these data is that, the, and we use percents because our, our, our number of students is so much smaller than the state. The state is 35,000 plus. And so this is um, the number of students that took the test in third grade reading. You can see that, that, that decline as, now this is all one year, uh, as we move from grade level to grade level. So the other notion that I want you to think about is where that 233 is this year, it's probable that we'll be somewhere around that same number in fourth grade next year. Some students that, um, you know, some students, may, it, take, may, it may take more than one year from the, for them to actually master that, that, that test. The other thing is you see those numbers Decrease by the time we get to fifth grade, where these numbers are very small. Um, fifth grade science, smaller. And then uh, one thing you have to keep in mind is that in sixth grade, we do have a bilingual program, but they only test in English. A Spanish option is not available. <coughs> so, going back, we talked about third grade. We had a 61% and the state had a 65. We picked up three points in fourth grade. Um, we also follow the state trends. You can see 86%. Uh, percent. We have clearly outperformed the state at 74%. In our Spanish, we see 41% of our students uh, did meet the standard, keeping in mind that group was about 131 kids. So we had 54 students that met the standard we had 77 that did not and we know who those kids are and we have them they're in our, they're on our radar we have a comprehensive plan each one of these students have a story of their own as dr stockton said some of these students are recent arrivals um, they are challenged with literacy in both their native language and english uh, and we have pretty comprehensive plans in place staff development for our teachers. We've introduced software programs this year uh, that work on comprehension and dealing with nonfiction text for these students. And of course, one of their greatest challenges is vocabulary. Uh, fourth grade writing, uh, you see that we are trending right, with the state. Can we go back? Sure. Go ahead. Well, my, my question was, um, this is at the fourth grade level. At the fourth grade level, the CISD, do they allow the, the, the kids to, to make the choice of either English or Spanish test as well? It's not a choice. It's not it, a is a, it, is a, it is a determination by the staff, by the teachers. Uh, it is done through a, through, through a process called the LPAC process. Uh, it, is, it is a study that those teachers are watching those students, working with them all year long. Um, they're giving, they're still working the program, their English and their Spanish. Uh, the staff is looking at their performance in English, looking at their performance in Spanish, and they will make that determination, what is the best assessment for that child to be successful? Very good. Is that the same in, uh, for the third grade, going back to the third grade kiddos? Um, they have that option to test in English or Spanish, yes, correct? Yes, it is the same. Is that 
is that uh, encouraged throughout the state of Texas as well for third graders? Or All is of that these CISD? are state processes. Yes. Now, it is, I cannot speak for other districts. Mm -hmm. um, we have an early exit program. Um, some states have a late exit program. Uh, I can only speak that our philosophy is that we, our, our focus is English literacy, but we all have to work within the parameters of the state and the state mandates and the state requirements. Right. So yes, that option is available. Okay. Dr. Gibson, I have a question as well. If the standard is not met, there's an action plan, as I understand. Yes. The action plan is in English? It, it depends. They are still in the bilingual program, so they are receiving instruction in both Spanish and English. Okay. So the plan will, basically, what it will do is it, it will identify their, their less than strengths. And the, both of those are carried out in both languages. Let's, let's say that it's main idea. So they'll have, they'll have text, main idea in Spanish, main idea in English, but they'll have interventions, additional repetitions, one-on-one, -on -one, tutorials, and each child will have their own menu of what their weaknesses are. Okay, thank you. Dr. Gibson, we, we, we declined year over year in Spanish, 2014 and 2015. What were the numbers? Uh, as opposed to the percentages. Say that again, we declined. We went from 51% to 41%. Right. So what were those numbers? The, the numbers of the students? Right. You know what, I can get you those numbers. I don't have them with me. The numbers for this year is 131. <coughs> I don't have last year's number in that same category with me, but we'll be happy to share that and send that to you. And, and what would you attribute that primary driver for that decline then? I think I heard you allude to a few things, but I, I, didn't, I didn't grasp over that. You know, each, each group is different, and um, in, in our minds, it's, it's not as much a decline as our successes on the English side. We are, um, I, I, can't, I don't know what that number is off the top of my head, but I think the most important thing to me, Mr. Williams, is student by student. Understood, fair enough. I understand the success on the English side, but I'm, I'm, I'm more so focused on are we, is that, is, is that taken away from the, I guess, the focus on the Spanish side of making sure our kids are, the kids that are taking a test in Spanish are, are being successful in that, in, in that test taking? <coughs> they are being, they are, our goal is every child, every year, is, is, has the skills to master that assessment when the time comes. Some students are, m are more ready than others. We may have students in this fourth grade that make it next year, that actually meet the standard next year. I guess I don't equate it from a decline from a 51 to a 41. I'd have to see what the numbers are. I agree. That's what I was. Yeah. That's right. And, it, and it's a different group of Number students one. too. That's right. that's what makes it more challenging. And some of these students are some may be recently arrivals. It's it's not a complete apples to apples. Dr. Gibson, I have one more question for you. Um, my understanding is we can't control when, <laughs> when the kids are are coming to the schools, right? So is there? It, in order to qualify to take this test, do they have to be enrolled at a certain time period? There, there is a snapshot date okay. that, for, this is for all students, there is right. a snapshot date, so the answer is yes. How much time do they have? I mean, what's the, what's the shortest time period they would have to be prepared for? Well, if they, if, if they, ha if they arrive at school, they have to take the test. Now, whether or not that test counts in our numbers if they're not here for snapshot date. But if they oh, arrive and they're here for a month, then they will they will take the test. End of October? Yeah. Okay. And I understand it's a different group of kids, but we're dealing with averages. So are there circumstances that are changing with the next group that are drastically different from the group that we currently have? I guess I'm kind of understand fully appreciate fully what 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 is changing is it from their end or is it from our end? you know i think you know i i'm not sure if i can give you an exact precise precise answer on that but I'll, i'm going <coughs> to give you a bullseye answer and that it depends on the kids and we may have a year that we have 12 students that are new arrivals to that group the next year we may have 26 the next year we may have 32 the next year we may have four the composition changes from year to year 
And I think what, what our focus in our district is, is that we drill down to the individual child. And for me, there is our, our systems work for all of the kids. And um, I'm not sure if I can give you a very precise answer on that. Fair enough. And I don't doubt, I don't for one second doubt that we're not focused on each kid. But from a board, we have to, we see, we see the numbers. And I raised the question simply because the numbers were. And wrong. I think it's, a, I think it's a valid, I think it's a valid point. Fair enough. Thank you. Yes, sir. If you go, if you go back to that reading slide, correct, I mean, I understand your point, Nature, but it looks to me like 14 was an outlier. Because if you look at 13 and 12 in the Spanish test, those are in the 40s as well. Yeah. So. I agree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I mean, I guess yeah, I'm. Kids yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, it's yeah, different it's groups. Just averages, so, so something had to change. Well, yeah, I think, you know, it's important. I think you all alluded to it. It's such a small sample set. Yeah. That's why that it, it changes pretty dramatically based on a handful of students. Based on two or three kids. Yeah. yeah. Understood. And, and, and the reality is, if, if we didn't have an early exit program, those scores wouldn't be like they'd be much higher than that because right. yeah, the kids in there. But, but, in but it's not just the kids. In the spirit of doing the right thing, mm -hmm. instead of worrying about what the number says, mm -hmm. we move the kids to English right. and let the number of the small subset, be it the ones that just got here that don't speak any English for whatever reason, and there are some that are just behind the others no, that for whatever is, reason. That, that is a great point, and we do the right thing when the right thing is to give them the Spanish assessment right. as well. And you're, you're identifying, what I like too, Dr. Gibson, is you're identifying each student yes. individually with specific plans of action for that student to be successful. Absolutely. Okay. So fifth grade reading, um, we, they, they combine the uh, scores and we do not have the state score yet, uh, but you can see that we are still doing very well. And then our fifth grade science, what's fascinating about this here again, we've outperformed the state clearly. And now we have, if you just want to talk numbers again, we have four, only 41 students that uh, actually sat for the Spanish assessment. And again, we know who those students are. We are working with them. And then when we get to sixth grade, all of the students take the English and here again, we are, we are trending with the state, and we have clearly outperformed the state 88% to 76%. Dr. Gibson, I have one other quick question. Yes, I sir. apologize. I know we have an early exit program. What is the state's exit program? What, what well, grade level? Well, when we talk about the state, the state is accumulative of all the ISDs. Correct. So when we say the state, it's a collection of all the ISDs. All thousands. All thousands. Okay. And so there, there is, we have an early exit program. There are some, there are some ISDs that have a late exit program, okay. which is their focus is to have the students in English by fifth or sixth grade. Okay. That's what I was trying to get at. So it's somewhere in the fifth or sixth grade range. Yes. We're trying to do it in the third, third grade range. Yes. Okay. And being very successful. Okay. <laughs> Good job. <clears throat> all right. Thank you, Dr. Gibson, and and I say, want to say thank you to Dr. Gibson and the elementary staff because the numbers that I get to present are the result of the great work that mm -hmm. we we do on the elementary level. As she said, the focus on the elementary level is for students to be successful in seven through twelve and and post high school as well, and our secondary numbers reflect that. And I think that's a celebration of what happens on the Spanish test side, but. Those are small numbers, but in, in just a majority of our classrooms, the great work that our elementary teachers do um, really lets our secondary schools start at a position of strength. And uh, as Mr. Husbands mentioned a few months ago, you looked at our SAT and ACT scores, how strong they were, are an indication of, of what's going on in our secondary schools. And I'm proud to say that these STAR and EOC scores are show the, the same picture. So we'll, we'll, we'll share those here quickly with you. We start with seventh grade. Um, you see reading and writing uh, performed very well. We, we were up in each of those categories and outpacing the state um, by a healthy uh, margin on the seventh grade level. Uh, eighth grade, uh, reading, we were, uh, 
down a few points, but still very healthy, 91%. We don't have a state number yet to see where that is. Um, eighth grade science and eighth grade social studies, um, both celebrations. Eighth grade social studies uh, is one to be real proud of. I think we have a, an eighth grade social studies teacher in the in the room here. Yeah, Mr. McCloy, congratulations on those eighth grade social studies scores. I uh, know that will make you proud, as we all are. And then as we get to high school, we go to the end of course exams. Those are the five uh, tests I remind you of that students must pass in order to graduate. Um, statewide, the most difficult um, star tests are the English one and English two. And so these are areas that we certainly would love to see our scores come up in and we will continue to work at it and they will continue to come up. But uh, also an area that we uh, tend to outpace the state by a large margin uh, in these. So that's an indication to us that you know, when the tests get more difficult, we tend to perform a little better compared to the state, and, and we like that. Um, the final three in the course exams, Algebra 1, very proud of. Algebra 1 is a, uh, as a course and an exam is typically one of those barriers to graduation. And when you see us at 89%, that is a number to be very proud of. A lot of great work in our math department. Um, and then biology and U.S. history, you know, at 96 and 97%, um, very strong. So um, it's, a, it's a great picture for the secondary scores, and that's a direct result of the great work that happens uh, K through 12, or <coughs> K through 12 in our district. I, I have a question about both the uh, uh, star and the end of course. Yes, sir. Just look, just pick seventh grade and 85% passing. Okay. Yes, sir. What, and I know it differs at different grade levels probably, but what, what is this indicative of? I, I know it's 85% 80, I got that of the students, yes. but is it through all test taking? One, two, three tests, you know, they get three yes, stabs sir. or whatever. So, and uh, so it's at the end of that. Then what happens in, on the star test? Is it seventh or eighth grade where they got to pass to move on or do they have yes, to sir. pass so, to move on? Or explain that to me and then the end of the course, again, what is that indicative of? Absolutely. At the end of the last, you know, uh, taking of the test that we offer, and then they've got to do something in addition to that. Right. So seventh grade is a one is a one shot test uh, on the seventh grade level. Okay. So they don't retest. They do, they take it one time and, and they're finished. Okay. Uh, when you go to the eighth grade level, science and social studies are the same. They are one shot tests. We get the results. Now this year, as Dr. Gibson said. You know, math is on a kind of a one-year hiatus from accountability, you know, both for the campus and for the student as an individual. So they only took that one time. But typically, in eighth grade, they would have three opportunities at reading and math okay. to pass. Okay, so um, that, that's the normal on the eighth grade level, and those are ones that they would need to pass in order to advance to ninth grade or a grade placement committee would meet uh, <laughs> to discuss if they were prepared to go on to ninth grade. When you get to high school, um, the original rules uh, indicated they had to pass all five tests to graduate. Um, and they have multiple opportunities. You may have a student that passes uh, English two, but still needs English, the English one test. And they may be taking that test again as a senior. They, multiple opportunities, our schools all have, and they're, they're all different just based on their schedules. They all have just very targeted interventions and programs set up to help students master the tests in which they were not successful at. And, you know, this past year we had Senate Bill 149, which allowed uh, committees to go back if there were students that had not passed all five and consider them for graduation. That is not something that, that may not be there forever. And, and certainly that's not our goal. Our goal is all students pass all five. And that's, that's the way we approach it. Thanks for sharing. Yes, sir. How many students are we seeing? Because I know that there's several talk about parents ki keeping kids home on star test days because they don't like it. How much are we seeing of that in the district? It's hard to say because there's not an opt out. It's not that's not really uh, mm -hmm. something that they can do. So uh, as far as if a student is not present on testing day, it's difficult for us to determine why they may not be present. Right. Um, you know, when you get to on the high school level, there, there are no options. Right. You, know, you, you must pass all five or you don't graduate. So okay. um, you, while there may be some of those decisions being made for younger students, once they get to high school, um, 
it's mm -hmm. they have to be there and, and for us the more data that we can have on a student Agreed. while they're younger helps us when they get to high school. I, you know, as a high school educator, I would love to see sixth, seventh, and eighth grade data on a test that just helps me prepare that student to be successful on algebra one or, or English one. So it, it does help <clears throat> us. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Hey, quick Thank question, you, Dr. Gibson. <coughs> Dr. Gibson, real, real quick, let's go to the sixth, sixth grade. That's just in that's in English. Yes. Okay. That's so, all English. So I understand that the purpose of your analysis, all the statistics before, but this is really your, for <laughs> lack of a better yeah. term, yeah, there it doesn't is. matter what the <laughs> what the yeah. score was in the first quarter, the second quarter. Yes. This is what's on the there scoreboard, and this is huge. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> but that's like so that's what really matters yes. at the end of the day, yes. which then lays mm -hmm. the foundation for Dr. Nolte. That's exactly right. Yeah, okay, I just want to point that out because eighty-eight percent, it really doesn't matter. Yes. Okay. Yeah, right. But the eighty-eight percent. Thank you. The eighty-eight percent here includes all students. Yeah. Right. That's the that's point. A, that's right. The that's the point. Yeah. Uh, it, it, Everybody has what, to take what it. What category actually does? Actually them. does. So if you have five or ten, it, uh, people taking a bilingual test, and you mingle that or you blend that with 10,000 kids, you're not going to see that. It ain't going to be a blip on the radar. But there is no bilingual test in sixth grade. That's, that's my point. Right. They're, that's included in the whole population. Well, for us, that's, for us, I mean, that is, for the state is a much bigger, they're 35,000 plus, understand. we're not that big. I understand. understand. But, 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 the, but the bulk of it does carry or help aid some of those those Absolutely. numbers is yeah. what you're saying absolutely yeah. that's a great point it. and that's exactly what we yeah. don't do in, in third and fourth grade uh, i do want to point out uh, and thank you for for digging yes. down in that information i want to do a few introductions we have uh, edith upshaw is our director of critical instruction staff developments here uh, thank you for that warm uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Aaron carlisle is the director of bilingual education and Julie English is our Director of Assessment, and I want to commend the three of them, <coughs> Shelly Winkler and Kathy. Um, this is just overwhelming, the response. Uh, I, want to, I want to thank them. They really, you know, we ask really tough questions. What is the best for our students? Um, and then they said so they really dug in and they brought the data to light, and, and it confirms what we're doing. So thank you for your hard work on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Item 5A, uh, consider approval of guaranteed maximum price amendment in the Woodlands High School locker room addition phase one. Dr. Stockton. Okay, Easy Foster, uh, Director of uh, Planning and Construction, please come and present these items. President Husbands, Dr. Stockton, members of the board, it's my pleasure tonight to bring forward for your consideration the approval of a guaranteed maximum price amendment for the Woodlands High School locker room additions, which is this, what we're talking about tonight is phase one. And we're asking you to make that approval and delegate the authority to execute the contract doc documents to Dr. Stockton. If you'll recall, at the April board meeting, the Board of Trustees selected Balfour Beatty Construction as the construction manager at risk for the Woodlands High School locker room additions. This is phase one of that project, which is the parking lot and infrastructure improvements that will allow us to take over some of the existing parking spaces for the actual building addition, which will be coming at a future board meeting. The district has executed a contract with Balfour Beatty, uh, which was reviewed and approved by outside counsel, and the guaranteed maximum price amendment sets the amount not to exceed for this phase at $402,747, as detailed in the attached proposal that was in your board book. Funding for this project comes from the general fund. At this time, I request your approval. So moved. I second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Questions? All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. All opposed, like sign. Thank you very much. Uh, item uh, 5B, design development presentation for new high school for Oak Ridge Feeders. <coughs> Mr. Foster, please. Uh, Dr. Null, please. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Thank you. Dr. Null. Well, good evening once again. Oh, we're very excited tonight to share uh, with you the progress that's been made on the design of the potential new high school in the Oak Ridge feeder zone. 
Um, tonight, what you will see is the result of a very strong collaborative effort between Ian Powell and Team PBK and Conroe ISD. Uh, we've had a great internal team that has spent countless hours working to get us to this point. I want to thank uh, Dr. Stockton and Dr. Hines for their vision and work on this. And we are so fortunate to have the expertise of Mr. Foster and his staff um, internally here at Conroe ISD to help us through this process. I uh, also want to thank the, our directors and Ms. Upshaw and the curriculum team for lending their expertise to the process. Our focus has been to design a campus that provides a classic and timeless appearance and is capable of meeting the student needs for today and for generations to come. The process began with the creation of an academic program that is very comparable to all of our other high schools and we worked to design a building to efficiently meet those needs. Special attention has been paid to flexible learning spaces and technology integration, as well as our new focus on CTE programs and robotics. We believe that the design that Mr. Powell has for you tonight meets our goals and will give the community, students, and future alumni a campus that they'll be very proud of. We look forward to your feedback after Mr. Powell's presentation. At this time, I will invite Ian Powell from PBK to come forward and share with us our progress. Thank you, Dr. Null. Good evening, President Husbands, members of the board, Dr. Stockton, administrative staff and guests. Thank you very much. This is, we're jazzed to be here tonight to bring you a design update on, on this next uh, big challenge, this new high school. And what I will tell you is um, I'd like to begin first by um, endorsing the exact same things that Dr. Null said just a moment ago about your staff. Outstanding. We've been on sort of a rampage of working with them since the beginning of this year. And they've been responsive. They've made themselves available for tours, for meetings, for uh, exhaustive conversations this way, that way. All the decisions get made in the design process. And I just want to say to all of them, thank you very much. It's been terrific. It bears uh, repeating, perhaps, to uh, identify some of the design goals that this work is predicated on. And the first was to plan the new high school based on an educational <coughs> program derived from all the Conroe ISD high schools designed for a capacity of 3,000 students in grades 9 through 12, to organize departmentally where instructional spaces are grouped together by subject matter, to include and incorporate state-of-the-art educational planning and design principles to promote student achievement with that as a high focus, to consider the Kate revisions that have been prompted by House Bill 5, to also consider other instructional modifications that are prompted by House Bill 5's graduation plan and the endorsements that they identify, modifications to the Texas Accessibility Standards that were brought forward in 2012, to plan for a much higher level of technology integration in the school, to implement the Conroe ISD security standards and protocols which have been underway for many years, to approach the development, literally the plans and specs, the nuts and bolts of what we do in a very different way, and use a Revit and building informational modeling uh, protocol which will afford your planning construction department, your maintenance department benefits long into the future for the facility. To bring a virtual tour of academic facility imagery to identify the options and the choices available, the myriad ch choices available for the character of the school. To undertake a live tour of new schools within the greater Houston area with administrative staff so that they could get a sense of what's un underway right now in the educational community. And very importantly, um, and thanks to Dr. Null for help in, in, in identifying and shaping this goal, to reflect the traditional values of the entire Conroe ISD educational community in a building that is intended to facilitate learning for the next 50 years and beyond. So if we begin from a macro point of view, this is Conroe ISD. I think you're all very familiar with that. And within the overall boundaries of Conroe ISD, that is the relative location of the new high school site. Within the Oak Ridge feeder zone, that is its position. And drilling down even further, there is the new high school site. Um, effectively, if you were to take Riley Fuzzle and continue on uh, northeastwards until it turns into a dirt road, actually, you would pass Creekside Village, I think, as a community, immediately to the, to the north, and the open land to the south opposite Creekside Village is the property in question. And this is uh, drilled down even further. That's the rough configuration of the site uh, in yellow, about 80, 80 plus acres. 
The two orange lines are the intended alignment in that location of the Grand Parkway. And we also identified the location and the proximity to three other CISD schools, Snyder, Snyder Elementary School, uh, Cox Intermediate, and York Junior High School. To illustrate some of the things which are coming next in this presentation, we thought it would be useful to walk you through the site plan as it's developed right at the moment. Effectively, it faces towards the north, what we call the plan north. And if you can follow where the cursor track is, is, is sort of rolling back and forth, that is the academic zone or wing of the campus. It is three stories tall, somewhat similar to College Park. There is a primary circulation spine that goes from the very front door of the school all the way to the back of the school. And as you take that journey from the front door of the school, you'll pass in this area the dining commons or cafeteria, as well as the library. And when you're back in this area, to the to viewers left will be the Kate facilities the Fine Arts and Performing Arts Center, and to the viewer's right will be the PE, Athletics, and Sports Facilities. Parking wraps the entire facility, uh, but for the west side. Um, sports facility, uh, facilities are organized uh, to provide optimum orientations and to be uh, economical in the site work that uh, goes along with that. There is a commercial reserve that's been left for other property owners up along Grand Parkway. So the building is set, set back from Grand Parkway on the right-hand side of your visual as well. And by the way, if I go through this too quickly, if there's any question along the way, please don't hesitate. I'd love to answer questions. This is a visual of the plan itself. At the first floor level, as I said before, the academic wing is represented by where the cursor is tracking from left to right with the front door in this location. As you take that journey I described before, you go past a, a large LGI, dining commons area, library, the kitchen and service areas, the Kate and current technology education uh, portion of the school, the fine arts area of the school, and the PE and athletics uh, part of the school. And this is the back door to the school uh, opening up to a courtyard. On the second and third floor, there is a continuation of the academic zones described previously. On the second floor level, on the left-hand side, viewers left, that zone is identified to uh, serve as a concentration for ninth grade instruction. On the third floor, we have concentrated and collected effectively all the utilities for somewhat more expensive space in your building to serve the science area and also to allow it to do a good job, a, a more simpler exhausting of the mechanical and ventilation requirements straight through the roof. And now to some of the images and the visuals associated with the plans you've just seen. Uh, as I mentioned before, there was a, a conversation that probably involved your administrators looking at hundreds, literally hundreds of different kinds of images of schools all over the nation and around the world, actually. And so those were character evaluations about what do we intend for the facility to look like. And at the end of the day, after a review of those hundreds of different images, this was the beginnings, point of beginning. This occurred, I think, Kirk, help me. Back, back in January, I think it was. January or February. And since that time, we've been very busy developing the technical side of the documents. And so that now starts to look like this. This is a view from if you were a bird about 600 feet up in the air uh, over Riley Fuzzle. What's Riley Fuzzle right now? This would be your view from the northeast. This is your view from the northwest. This is a lower level view showing the entire front facade of the school. The main entrance to the facility. I described the um, entrance at the back side of the back door of the school. This is the courtyard with the uh, fine arts facilities to the left hand side, viewers left, uh, the PE and athletic areas to the uh, viewers right. This is a view of the library. It's in that core that extends from the front door to the back of the school. And a primary or main student entrance is located just to the right-hand side of that image. This is a view inside the building. If you were to walk through the front door and look back where you just came in, this is the uh, entrance there at the main corridor. This is that same view taken from the second floor. So you're on the academic level, second floor looking back at that location. This is a view into the library, looking out of the library. A view of the library looking the other way towards a component that's 
we think it's pretty cool. There, you've got a think tank positioned. We'll go to that and just want, there's the think tank. And that's the interface between the corridor and dining commons as well as the uh, uh, remainder of the library. Interior view of the dining commons itself. It's an isometric describing how the classroom layout occurs within the wings and the collaboration and flex learning spaces that were arrived at through discussions with your staff. This is an example of a collaboration space, a flexible learning space. Do we this have to look over at any of the other high schools? No, go for one. Which way, sir? The, bal the balcony, the railing kind of deal. Yes. We do? College Park. College Park? Yeah. Okay. The Woodlands has an area that way. Okay. Most of the bigger schools, Oak Ridge, I think they all do actually, yes, sir. Okay. Communicating stairways between the third and the second yes. academic levels. This is a hypothetical um, of what the, the entrance to the gymnasium might be off of a primary circulation corridor. This is the view from within the gym. I used this earlier today, but I'll use it again. I'm pleased to report that the home team is winning by 12 points. <laughs> Putting some points up. And our schedule. The red line describes where we are today in July 2015 and the, the bar chart that steps through each one of the phases for the project. We are literally exactly on schedule. We have a lot more of the technical documentation, uh, effectively the things that are probably viewed as the plans and specifications that are developed for contractors, in this case your CM at risk contractor to propose from, shows a 30-month construction schedule uh, concluding with opening in August of 2018. And uh, with that, we're, we're completed. We'd be happy to answer any questions you have. I have a, I have a question. Yes, sir. <clears throat> um, this is a 9 through 12 campus, mm -hmm. and I know that we've and we just converted Conroe to have a ninth grade campus and the Woodlands has a ninth grade campus. Are we not doing a ninth grade campus or is there an ability to add a ninth grade campus later on? Why is that? Well, what we've done in the other, with the other school <coughs> went over capacity. That's when the boards had a discussion about adding a ninth grade campus. So it would be at a different site at that point. If, if we get to that point, um, you know, it's hard to tell way in the future what the growth will be like. But we do have that capacity to do that at some point and turn this into a 10 through 12. This facility would be designed to function much like College Park functions today with a separate, you know, as Mr. Powell said, on that second floor, mm -hmm. a separate wing. Mm -hmm. So the freshmen will still have their own area that would allow them that transition into high school. We get a lot of the same benefits of a ninth grade campus that just happen within the same building. Do you guys mind going back to the very first of the picture of the? Yes, sir. Yeah, that one. This one. Okay. And, and I know we've probably addressed this before, but the property to the south east. Sir. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, all the way. That whole wooded area. All of this. Mm -hmm. Right. What is this? What is the anticipated use for that? Do you? Does anybody know? Residential. Yeah, that's yeah. all told. Brothers. Okay. So that's that's why I thought it was residential. Yes, sir. But it's already. So eventually, so most of the school will be surrounded by residential. Is that the? I mean, nobody knows for sure, but that's the plan. Yeah. Literally, that's the perfect way to say it. I mean, we've heard conversations uh, not only with, within the school district but outside the school district about developer um, goals and decisions, and we've seen preliminary documents that show that as residential development. And it's 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 amazing from our standpoint to see things which probably would not have been viewed as developable land area, and it's becoming so because of the efforts of of um, developers. Is that, mo uh, that, I mean, that that space right by the square, is it multi-owners or is that, you know, additional Toll Brothers property or is it multiple owners or, or do we even know that information for sure? Uh, uh, I, I we do. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Cox is... The, I, I'm the, not asking specifically. The, 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 the dirt cleared area is the current development for Toll Brothers going on. All of, just keep going down. 
that's Toll Brothers property. Okay. It goes all the way down to yeah. till it hits Bender's Landing. The property to the n north, that part, the, all of that's Hilliard property. Yes, sir. And then you go further north and you get into, there's a couple of other landowners. A group by the name of RICO owns everything. Basically, if you go on further down this way, at, and you keep, go past, all the way down to Kingwood, basically, is owned by a group called RICO. All of those intend to have residential, multi, um, you know, traditional development, residential developments. Uh, obviously, it's going to be a very challenging process to develop all of that land. But, but that, uh, <coughs> that is the, uh, everything I've heard from every developer is, I mean, it, it, ultim it eventually will be developed. Like, Similar to Camp Strike. I mean, you know, you're not going to be able to develop 100% of the property, but you're going to be able to mix uh, residential, probably mostly residential development with some commer thank, like thank commercial. You, yeah. you know, the other area you didn't mention is Holcomb's properties. Yeah, that's on, yeah, that's, across the, that's across, across the, the way. Across the Grand Parkway. That's across the Grand Parkway. Yeah. No, that's on the, yeah, that's over, around, wraps around Creekside there. Uh, yeah. And that, that's an area we're looking at a site in there. We're looking at another s potential elementary site in the in the Toll Brothers property. Thank you, sir. Very active, uh, active area. I have, I have a question about the uh, CT program. Uh, yes, sir. Wing, uh, space, whatever. Uh, and this may start with Dr. Hill, but what have we, I mean, I see ag fab and building trades and robotics. What have we told them to plan for, and how do we know? I mean, I've seen over the years CT programs come and go, be moved, and so on and so forth. How do we know uh, that you don't have, end up having a uh, auto tech lab there just because you say there's not going to be today, or maybe there is going to be, and I'm not reading it right. In, I don't know. In general terms, we, we looked at all of our high schools and had – looked at what site-based CTE programs we had. Because of the location of this campus, we don't anticipate it ever housing district-wide programs that we would bring students from other schools to because of its remoteness. So the programs that we've designed in right now for this campus are the ones that our other high schools have on site. Now, very true, these things could change, but, but the labs that we have, for example, Building Trades Lab, or ag mech lab those are large shop areas and they may change in 10 or 15 years as trends change but they'll be able to function and flex to whatever the new with them being part of the major build the next the next question to follow that up mm -hmm. with and thank you for answering that successfully as far as i'm concerned the next question i have is you know when you're talking building trades or, or ag labs or whatever uh the the ability to to uh for traffic I mean, you know, uh, I, I, again, I don't know if they're building trailers in, mm -hmm. in the welding shop or whatever. But they've got to be able to get things in and out, or otherwise it causes a heck of a traffic jam. And I, with the buildings as a part, excuse me, with those areas being part of the main building, I'm concerned about that access in and out, the, the ability to have flow. Absolutely. And if, if you look, and this is, you know, this is a, I just can't tell what I'm an overall about. site plan here. If you look at on the, what's on the screen now at the cursor, You'll see all of this is, is drive and it's large and then and even coming down here like that's a representation of an 18 wheeler that size so you can see the amount of, of space coming out of these uh, CTE areas and there's um, roll up doors yes sir roll up doors you can see even the, the doors coming out the picture you know. right but we we did take that into account Mr. Ship um, played a big role in looking at these with us and actually we had CTE department chairs from two different high schools come in and help us build that area. Yes, I'm, so. I'm, I'm just questioning. Yes, sir. Good. Also, it looks like on that same thought, if whatever projects you have going on, you can't see them from the road. I mean, it's hidden behind the, yes. by the academic built wings as well. Right. And, and I actually like this, but I'm going to ask a question. Of, or It also concerns me. You got this big, beautiful entrance. But if people are going to come to your auditorium, they're going to drive around the circle to the back and park in the big parking lot and go into the auditorium rather than trans 
transfer all the way through the school. Yes, okay? sir. And I think that's great to keep people out of the school at nighttime for an mm -hmm. event or whatever. But it's also doing away. I mean, you don't get to come through the grand entrance. The, and oh, that's I just thought I'd ask. Well, no, and you're no. and you're right. And Can't that's wait to we <laughs> we we did think of that and. That and Mr. Powell and his team did a great job. This is that back door. And, and this is pretty. Don't get me yes, wrong. Sir. But it's not that. No, it's not the same. It's a little smaller version, but it does have that character. But but you're right. Um, we wanted the the nighttime entrance, as we call it, to also have a nice character and be inviting and warm. And there are small things here that make a huge difference. You know, as a parent, you know, you, you can drive up to a school if you're going to watch one of your children play a game. And if you don't know where the gym is, you can't find it. You know, it's hard. And you can see how they've integrated, you know, the auditorium name and the gym name <coughs> into the, the masonry there so that when folks do visit, it's going to be a, it's, well, you know, it's going to make sense. I and, actually like it. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to get to go during the daytime, daytime and go through the front door also. Right. But I, I was just, it, this was kind of worrying me a little you're, bit. Yes, sir. You're in, but I, I, I can see the plan, and, mm -hmm. uh, and and I have seen problems containing people at night in in, in open buildings. Right. So thanks. That's the yes. courtyard, correct? Yes, sir. Yes. we talked about. Yes, okay. Yes, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Thank you. Questions? Concerns? <clears throat> if, if there's, I think it's beautiful. Great job, John. Thank you very much. But w with your permission, may I offer some acknowledgments to some of the team yes, to help get us to this please. point? Please. Obviously to the school district, but I'd like to acknowledge Kirk Madison from PBK, Nathan Geyer from PBK, Harry <coughs> Mack, PBK, Jorge, Jorge Tiscarino is not with us. He's the primary designer. He couldn't be here tonight. I think he's taking care of kids tonight. But he's very involved. Behind, behind, him, uh, behind Emily is Jander Ortiz. I think I see Brian Hood in the back as well. And I thought I would mention one thing to you, um, which, we're, which I'm particularly proud of. I've served on the board of the Education for Tomorrow Alliance for, I think it's nine years now. And so part of their programs involve student internship programs. So one of the people behind me, this young lady, Emily Knapp, came to us in 2009. She graduated from Oak Ridge High School in 2010. And she is a contributor. She got her undergraduate degree from AM. <laughs> you know, I wanted to say it just that way because she's now getting her master's at UT. All right. <laughs> and I will tell you, she has a job at PBK the instant she graduates because she's just that strong a kid. She is that good, and, and we're, we're happy to have her. She's a product of Conroe ISD, and she's terrific. So, anyway, yeah. thank you very much. <laughs> Beautiful presentation, and uh, uh, we appreciate the teamwork and the partnership with PBK, and uh, looking forward to seeing that project develop. And, and thank you for the A team for being here. Good job, guys. Item uh, 5C: Selection of the ND1, ENV1. Sorry, I don't know what engineering to perform commissioning services. Related to the construction of the new high school in the Oak Ridge feeder zone, Dr. Stockton. Mr. Foster, please present that item. President Husbands, members of the board, Dr. Stockton, it's my pleasure to bring forward for consideration <coughs> and approval the selection of NV Engineering to perform commissioning services related to the construction and the design uh, of the new high school for this Oak Ridge feeder zone. NV Engineering is recommended as a selection to perform commissioning services on this building. Uh, because they, they come recommend to us, re recommended to us for use on projects of this size and complexity from other school districts. Uh, it's, it's an investment that we haven't undertaken on a project of this size. We have, ex we have explored commissioning services on smaller projects and found it to be a very worthy investment. Uh, it is also becoming part of the industry standard. I was uh, visiting with another commissioning agent uh, today, as a matter of fact, and the new energy codes seem to be pointing towards this becoming a requirement for building construction. So this puts us uh, on the leading edge of, of commissioning services. Commissioning in general is a service provided by a professional engineering firm. So they're looking over the shoulder of our design team as they're putting the systems together during the, this level of design development uh, as we start investigating the systems that are going to operate this building from building automation, air conditioning, plumbing, electrical, lighting, 
uh, any system that, that helps us have a healthy educating environment. This is a third party that not only participates in the design process as another opinion, but during the construction process as a third party review for installation on the most complex systems within the building. A building of this magnitude, for example, in our building automation services has <coughs> over 1,000, 1,500 points of communication with just the air conditioning system alone. So part of the, the this contract is for a point-to-point -point verification of that system working so that the air does what it's supposed to do when it's supposed to do it. It also verifies that the things are installed according to the design specification and that they operate according to the most efficient standard possible. And that's where the investment turns a return for us. Because not only is it designed right to run right, we're verifying that we squeeze every penny about out of the operation. So at this time, I would, uh, we feel, the district feels, Envy has uh, to be a highly qualified uh, firm based on their demonstrated competency and their qualifications. The district has negotiated or believes we have negotiated a contract at a fair and reasonable price for their services, and that contract was outlined in your, mm -hmm. in your attachment. This time we request your approval to select Envy for this service. Entertain a motion. Motion. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Questions? I have one. Um, they're here to look over the shoulder. They're here to. Uh, who is the. Who has the final. What if we have a difference of opinion? I'm talking about it at the installation. Not even is it installed correctly, because that's probably a matter of fact. But um, an opinion as to which way an air handler will do the best job or which air handler would, you know, whatever. Who has the final say? You? Well, when it comes or to well, us well, or whatever. Uh, the district does. And when it comes to building operational components, our, our maintenance department, our director of maintenance, Marshall Schrader and his department, would actually have the final say on operational decisions. So this is a, a firm to help us make sure uh, it, it's really a team effort, a collaborative effort to get all those design and, opportunities on the table to be. And, and my question isn't designed to, 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 to make it combative that, because that's not the point. But I mean, I, my question is we're already holding accountable by bond, by E&O, by w whatever punitive measure you can think of all our design teams and engineers and architects and, 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 and construction trades people and so on and so forth, and some even some of the subs bid sometimes or bond sometimes. So I'm, I'm not quite sure. <coughs> I, I mean, it's a level of expense, and I feel like I owe it to the taxpayer, to this board, to question why another layer when we're dealing with such professionals that are backed by their various back. I don't, I don't know. Uh, it, 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 it's a relatively simple answer, and, and the answer is that we're, we're hiring them to look over the shoulder of the most complex systems in the building. So I'm not paying another engineer to look at the carpet installation, for example. This is uh, this targeted for the electrical lighting, lighting controls, building, building yeah. automation, air conditioning, plumbing, things of that nature, which there are so many moving parts, and even as, as expert as our teams are in the field and construction, uh, we pay PBK architecture to administrate the contract. Uh, their design engineers design and, and, and help administer, but this firm's sole purpose is to make sure everything is as efficient as possible and installed correctly. And we, we gain our, our value back on efficiency, but we also gain our value back by finding the mistakes that people who are on this job site every day walk right past because they saw it once, they said I was going to write it down, this firm is paid to log those issues, track those issues to completion, and make sure that we don't repay for rework later in the future. Well put, and thank you for answering that question for me. It's make me feel more comfortable. Any yes, other sir. questions, discussion? Just one more comment. If you'll remember uh, a couple of years ago, we did a continuous commission program, and, and even buildings that we, we found buildings that were relatively new to very old, and we were able to squeeze, squeeze anywhere from 9 to 19% more out of that energy efficient during the commissioning process. Fantastic. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank I you for your question. answer. I have a question. Yeah. Certainly. <laughs> it, it's been a few days since I've read through the board book again. Can you remind me, this is, is this the one that has the female-owned business and yes. she's a licensed engineer and yes. they've got a lot of experience doing a lot of different school districts? As I recall, that is, that is absolutely okay. correct. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Right. I just yes. wanted to clarify that. I thought so, but I wanted to make that clear. Thank you. 
Anything else? All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. All opposed, like sign. Thank you very much, Mr. Foster. Item 5D, Capital Improvements Update. This time I'd like to give you our monthly update on our capital improvements projects underway. <coughs> we're going to start with the Oak Ridge High School ninth grade campus. And I'd like to describe both projects we're going to talk about today are both scheduled to open for school this year. They're both at the same level of completion, and they're both on schedule and on target to open for mm -hmm. our students on time. Starting at Oak Ridge ninth grade, you've seen the, the front entry. It's been complete for some time now. As we're working our way around the building now, every day, these pictures are a week old now, but every day the, the site looks uh, more and more complete. You're looking at the exterior of the building on the art and uh, lab, and you're looking at the art courtyard behind that curved wall. Inside this area, the culinary labs, the art labs, uh, and the largest classroom. Inside the building, you're seeing the finishes come together. Our light fixtures are in, our ceiling grid's in, the air conditioning system is running. Uh, our utility provider was gracious enough to deliver us our much-needed uh, transformer uh, earlier in June, or actually earlier this month in July, so we could get those systems operating and running. You see the classrooms are nearing completion. Uh, what The ceilings are still open because we're working with our maintenance department now to verify everything above those ceilings is, is complete and correct before we cover them up. This is the inside of the new science labs, which is on the opposite end of the building from what we were looking at on the exterior a moment ago. The plywood you see on the window in the back has since been removed. So like I said, these pictures are a week old. Things are coming together at a very rapid pace at this point. Oak Ridge Elementary, again, you're seeing the, the same level of completion. Uh, you recall the work in this campus started in earnest when school got out. Uh, so as soon as the students were out of the way, we went to work with our crews getting our district uh, stuff and materials out of the way and then our contractor took everything from the ceiling up completely out of the building. So since June 6th, this building has gone from a functioning school, everything gone, the air conditioning is back on and the school is, is back in process. And again, we're working with our maintenance department ensuring that everything is, is complete uh, before we cover the ceilings up. As we move through this, this was, like I said, most of the work was above the ceiling, so you're seeing the new fire sprinkler system, the new ductwork, the new technology components that were added to this campus. In here, the, the, the man in this picture is, our, is performing test and balance, which is one of the third party verifications we're required to do by law. And he is measuring the amount of airflow coming out of that particular air register. But I point that out because what we just talked about, the commissioning process goes uh, a exponentially beyond what this man is doing. So we're going, they're going from that point all the way back to the original equipment how it was specified, how it was installed, how it was assigned, what was the intent of it to do, and making sure it does what it's supposed to do. Again, more of the same. This building, uh, as I walk through it even today, uh, the ceilings are beginning to be closed up and covered up, so it is uh, becoming a clean, functional working environment again. And that is our update. Just one quick question. Absolutely. Uh, new floors in that building? Uh, that building got new carpet, new tile in 2010. So as a life cycle, uh, it is not, not quite ready for new floors. Okay, so my question really doesn't apply to that school Certainly. because you were tearing the ceilings up, but in the in the ninth grade campus, I noticed the carpet's down and the ceiling tiles aren't in. Now, I mean, I've seen some ceiling tiles be put in in my time. <laughs> it's a messy operation. The cleanup on <coughs> the carpet has got to be, uh, why? Because, because you just have that much upstairs mm -hmm. work being done you had to get the floors in or a lot well, a lot of that is a factor of that transformer i mentioned if entergy had delivered us our transformer in april when we had asked for it we would have had the air on and things would have happened in a different order so at this point uh, i'm not going to call it a contingency plan but work progresses things that can be installed without a conditioned environment are being installed and but like i said entergy delivered their transformer uh first week of july <laughs> And we are off to the races at this point. Thanks. Any other questions? One question. Uh, the, the Mitchell um, ceiling or the roof, roof. How, how, is, how is that coming? Is that say, say that one more time. Mitchell roof. The Mitchell, Mitchell roof? roof. Uh, that, roof, that roof is completely dry at this point. Uh, so the, they've been tearing it off. Uh, if you can imagine, the rain we had earlier in the summer was very detrimental to that project. But the roof is completely dry at this point. 
the windows, I believe, are, are complete. That part of that scope is done. So the, the major portion of the work, the loud, the noisy, the messy part of the work is complete. And the, the job overall is scheduled to be complete before the students come back in August. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Foster. You. Thank you. Item 7A, um, preliminary 2015-16 budget presentation. Okay, Darren Rice, if you'll come and present uh, the good news about our budget. President Husbands, members of the board, Dr. Stockton, it's my pleasure this evening to present the 2015-2016 preliminary budget. <coughs> we always like to start our budget presentation with our financial highlights for the year. Uh, CISD received a five-star rating by the 2014 Financial Allocation Study of Texas, the FAST report. This is a report generated from the Comptroller's Office that uh, is based on academic and financial performance. And we are one of only four ISDs to receive a five-star rating all five years that this has been in existence. We have the lowest tax rate at $1.28 compared to our area peer group. And we use $17 million of a budget surplus to build the Oak Ridge ninth grade edition without issuing any new debt for this project. And this chart just shows the other districts that also received the five stars for five consecutive years. Our 2015 ERG position, ERG is the Education Resource Group. They also do an analysis based on academic and financial performance, but they do it on the 200 largest districts in the state. And the goal here is to be in the 1-1 box. And if you look in the top right-hand uh, area of that, of that graph, you will see us in the 1-1 box with the red dot. And on the right are the nine districts that also were in the in the one one box, and we're we're ranked third out of the state. We always like to go through the process of budget comparison to the state based on our averages by function. Uh, in instruction, we spend sixty two point seven nine percent compared to the state at fifty nine point oh nine percent. That's a difference of three point seven percent, and that represents a difference of $14.6 million if we were at the state average of 59.09. So we spend that more additional in that area. In central administration, we spend less than half of the state at 1.78% compared to 3.83%. Darren, that's a percentage of the total budget, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, plant maintenance and operations, we're at 10.08% compared to 11.35 at the state. In 0506, we were at 12% in this category. Uh, due to our uh, energy savings and everything like that, uh, we've been able to, to bring that down to 10%, but that equates to $7.9 million in today's dollars that we're able to spend on instruction now. Our budgeted expenditures per student, we spend $7,128 compared to the state at $7,915. That's a difference of $787. Uh, but what that tells us as we look at the FAST report from the Comptroller's Office, the RG report, is that we're able to achieve high academic outcomes in a cost-efficient manner. This is just a chart to show a reflection of, of where we've been with our tax rate. In 05-06, uh, we were at $1.76, and compared to our uh, peer groups, we were ranked second, just behind Klein. Now looking at our 2014-2015 combined tax rate comparison with area school districts, we're currently at $1.28, which is 48 cents lower than we were in 0506. We're 20 cents below our peer average tax rate, and we're 11 cents below our closest district, which is Klein. So in good position with our tax rate. This chart represents a trend of our general fund balance. In 2003, we were about $40 million of fund balance. In two, we ended 2014 at $101 million in fund balance. And if you look at the columns with the red at the top, that red identifies where we were able to use a majority of our, our surplus in those years for construction projects that helped us avoid issuing new debt. So now as we 
get into the budget process and into the parts. The first thing you want to look at is your budget, budget objectives. And our first objective is to meet the needs for the 2015-2016 school year. We want to provide a competitive raise and additional salary adjustments in identified areas. And we want to utilize budget surplus to support capital projects and reduce bond debt requirements. The next step we look at is just an analysis of our fund balance. In 2014-2015, our budget was $395.1 million, and our objective is to maintain an unassigned fund balance of 16 to 24% of the annual budget, which gives us approximately two to three months' worth of expenses. 16% of our budget is $63.2 million. 24% of the budget is $94.8 million. Estimated unassigned fund balance at 831.15 is $110.8 million, which is 28% of the budget, and $16 million over the high end of our target. Our attendance data, <coughs> state revenue estimates and campus expenditure budget allocations re rely on enrollment data. We're using 1,400 as growth for this year in our students, uh, giving us to an enrollment of 57,792, and that is for budgeting purposes. This chart here just shows a trend of our enrollment, enrollment growth. In 06 07, we're about 44,000 students. In 1516, we're estimating 57,792. That, that trend line's pretty straight. You don't see any dips or any waves. It's pretty linear, I guess would be the, be the our, word there. What's our enrollment again? 57,792. What's the average state? Sir? What's the state average? I do not have that information. I can get that for you, though. I don't know the average state. Somewhere between 50 and 200,000. <laughs> <laughs> reason I ask is because we're doing a percentage comparison on the first slide, mm -hmm. and I like to see how much we're leveraging our fix. Some of those, some of those line items are fixed. Right. Right. So you're leveraging that. That's driving them, those numbers down. Yes. So it's as opposed to some of the variable costs where we're comparing apples to apples. You get me? Yes. Certified property values. We're estimating our certified property values to increase 10.6% or $2.85 billion, giving us a certified value of $29.8 billion. Uh, we will be receiving certified values uh, the 25th of July. One of the things that came out of the past legislative session is Senate Bill 1, which increased the homestead exemption from 15000 to 25000 This results in an assessed value decrease to the district estimated at $611.5 million. Uh, this causes an MNO funding loss of $6.4 million, an INS funding loss of $1.5 million for a local tax funding decrease of $7.9 million. However, the district will be held harmless for any revenue lost. On the MNO side, the state will be making adjustments to the formula. And on the INS side, hold harmless is applied to any debt issued prior to 9 1 15. New bond issues are not eligible for revenue protection. And uh, we're still waiting on the final formulas, but we feel pretty confident with where we're at with those. So our 2015-2016 funding estimate, our state and local increase based on a 10.06% AV growth and 1,400 ADA increase is $27.6 million. We are losing $3.5 million. The state is no longer funding the 1.5% TRS contribution. They funded it for one year only. Um, we have the available surplus from our 2014-2015 budget of $22.1 million, giving us a total estimated available funding of $46.2 million. The net revenue growth is equal to 24.1. Um, Darren, yes, can I, real quick. So the 10.06 10 AV growth includes the loss yes, from the increased home Yes, ma'am, that is already okay. accounted for. Hmm? I wanted to make sure. So now we'll move to the expenditure side of our budget. And payroll is 88.6% of our budget. Teachers are the largest portion of that. So we'll start with our teacher hiring schedule. This schedule includes a 3% general pay increase, which is a $1,625 raise with targeted equity adjustments for teachers with 10 years plus of service. 
And this proposed uh, hiring schedule has a beginning teacher salary of $50,000. So looking at our 15, 16 salary increase, a 3% general pay increase is $8.9 million. Adjustments to teachers over 10 years is $593,000. Auxiliary adjustments pay grade one another, $850,000. And one of the effects of this adjustment is all starting auxiliary salaries will be at least $10 per hour. Adjustment for special education aids, an additional 2% is $104,000. We're increasing our bilingual stipend to market. We're increasing from $2,000 to $3,000 with that stipend at a cost of $348,000. And other miscellaneous stipends increase of $92,000, giving us a total salary increase of $10.9 million. Now our personnel for student growth, once again, we're anticipating 1,400 new students. So that includes 96 and a half teachers, 13 and a half paraprofessionals, for total uh, campus support at 110 positions for a cost of $5.6 million. Looking at our total 15-16 personnel additions, once again, 1,400 student growth is 110 positions, $5.6 million. We have 29 and a half additional program additions at a cost of $1.2 million for total personnel additions of 139.5 uh, positions at a cost of $6.8 million. Go back to that slide, Yes, sir. Can you slow down this? Yes, sir. Dr. Shackman, did you anticipate any central administration ads? Do I anticipate central administration ads? Correct. The um, personnel? These are all considered central administration ads. Because they're off they're off the campus. This on this district. Specifically um, with the growth that we're anticipating? Well these are the these are the positions we're anticipating adding. Of the 29 and a half positions that we're adding, 19 of them are in the auxiliary area. The majority of those are bus drivers. 10 of those are bus drivers. The rest are maintenance and custodial uh, people. The other areas, like Dr. Stockton said, are, are central administration positions. Thank you. Central administration meaning here? Well, so, well some of them are. Like some the lead nurse is, is housed here. Um, the uh, technical support is, I guess, technically Housed here, yeah, um, they're out working but, but they're not all the assigned time. to a campus necessarily. Yeah. Behavior okay. support is a secretary position. Mm. Sorry, I can't hear you. The behavior support is a secretary position that's here. Curriculum instruction. Human resources is here. Mm -hmm. yes. Directly supporting your primary cabinet is what I was alluding to. A reference or getting to supporting our primary cabinet. Yeah, I mean your your. <coughs> There's not a cabinet level position addition. Is there, have we, have you had any, I mean, I, we had what, 1,400 kids last year, 1,400 kids this year. Yeah. Has there been an expansion of the staff here? Is there a need for more support staff? There are. District level here? Yes, we have added positions here. Um, several of these positions are here. Last year we added a handful. Uh, Shelly. Shelly. <laughs> Shelly. Um, With the additional growth you're anticipating, do you do you foresee any additional needs there? Is, is, I, I guess at, my at concern. Cabinet is, level? Yes. Uh, not in the not in the immediate future. Not immediate. So not in the next year, let's say. Um, but we'll we'll analyze that every year and see what the, the what the needs bring. Um, the cabinet the cabinet's a very talented group and. Um, we don't add cabinet level very often, mm -hmm. um, but we do. When we do, it's based on need, like when we brought Miss Winkler and on and, uh, and screen on. Did you have someone more so assisting with, say, for instance, um, um, Mr. Foster's operation? We brought an assistant on for him last year. <coughs> uh, assistant director. And he's in the process now as we go through these okay. projects this year, uh, analyzing what his needs are.
question? No, go ahead. Now looking at our other expense detail, we have an increase in utilities of a million dollars, uh, increase in our appraisal district fee, $700,000, supplies for campus growth of 1,400 students, 125,000, uh, equipment and supplies are auxiliary departments, 194000 We were able to identify 300000 worth of savings in fuel at our transportation department. We're purchasing new AutoCAD software for our career and technology department of 50000 District-wide Microsoft Office licenses, 122000 Web page support for our new CISD website, 40000 And insurance and other expenses, $95,000 for a total other expense increase of $2,026,000. I have a question on the fuel savings. Yes, sir. Is that related to just the cost of fuel? The price. For price. the diesel? I know several years ago we went out and purchased some propane buses. Yes, that is reflective yeah. of the price of diesel. Now, we identified a lot larger portion when we were doing the budget at this time, but we we, we just took about half of that, anticipating prices creeping sure. back up, which they have. We sure, sure. So. But, I mean, is it so? It's just the price of diesel, primarily. Yes, sir. Okay. That's the that's the largest piece of our force or diesel buses. Right. Right. I understand. And really, you're predicting at this point it would be like around six hundred, but your budget you're budgeting for three hundred just yeah, as a we're contingency. Being, con being conservative. Thank Unless you have a way of locking it in, you can't. You can't do that. No. You, yes, right. That's a moving target. On the utilities, yes, because of our increased footprint ninth grade campus you know more, more yeah that, that is I mean, I mean we've gotten all this savings and unfortunately sometimes you know, you, you, at some point you're, the bottom. you're bouncing off the bottom <laughs> and and now we're growing <laughs> and so that has to take that yes in. sir that is for additional kilowatt hours per square foot right there yes sir so now looking at our total proposed budget increase the salary increase 10.9 million Personnel for growth of 1,400 students, 5.6 million. Personnel for uh, program additions, 1.2 million. Our health fund funding proposal, that is the district contribution increasing uh, from $396 per employee per month to $428 per employee per month for a cost of 1.8 million. And our other expenses we just detailed of 2,026,000, giving us a total budget increase of $21.5 million. So now our 2015-2016 proposed budget, a revenue, our 1415 budgeted revenue, which includes the $22 million surplus, $417.2 million. Our 15-16 projected revenue increase of $24.1 million gives us a projected 15-16 budgeted revenue, $441.3 million. On the expense side, our 14-15 budgeted expenses is $395.1 million. Salary increase, 10.9 million. Additional personnel, 6.8 million. Other expenses, 3.8 million, giving us a projected 15-16 budget expense of $416.6 million. At the end of this, we're left with a surplus of $24.7 million. Uh, the $21.5 million budget increase on the expenditure side is equal to 5.4% budget increase compared to last year's spending. Mr. Mr. Wright. Wright. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to, could you go back to the other expenses? Yes, sir. I'm, <clears throat> from the information I had, I'm off. Okay. I'm trying to figure out where. Oh, I see it now. The MCAD fees? Yes, sir. Originally, I think on the workshop, it was shown at $250,000. Now it's up to $700,000. Was that just a misprint or? Is it what, what, $450,000 difference? Yeah, we, we've had fee increases each year, but we've held that back from the budget process. We've been able to absorb that, but now we've had several year of in, years worth of increases, so we needed to uh, address that in this budget is what, is what you're seeing. And that, that was the increase, what you're seeing on that first presentation mm -hmm. was what we were just anticipating for this year, but we felt we needed to go ahead and address the full amount that we've absorbed in previous years. Why do those, pardon the ignorance, why do they go up and down? I mean, is it? Is it On the, well, the MCAT fees, they don't go down. I hate to say that. They're, they're so, continually okay. growing. Okay. okay. <laughs> you know, that, that's just naive on my part. Yeah. Just, but why do they go up? Explain to me, is it related to, uh, you know, uh, 
Oh. Well, as the you know the, the appraisal district, the way it's set up, your your portion of their budget is based off your tax base, and so as their budget goes up, and our tax base is one of the largest ones, we get a larger portion of that increase. Thank you. So, I'm sorry. I'm still not. I, I'm sorry for being obstinate, or maybe I just don't get it. So, we had budgeted two hundred fifty thousand. And you said we were absorbing something. Yeah, in previous years, we've had budget increases from them about $250,000 a year. Okay. But we did not include that as an increase to our budget. But now it's getting to a certain, uh, such a large amount, we deemed it necessary to come with the full amount that we've absorbed over the last several years. Well, what do you been So is it going to go up $450,000 each year? Well, that's my question. Well, out of budget surplus, I mean, it's we, really we found, we've been able to find money in, in, in areas to absorb that. That cost How much has increased? It's about two hundred fifty thousand a year. This year was actually larger. It was about four hundred thousand dollar increase. Okay. All right. That's another question. Thank you. Can we go back to the line item expense as percentage of budget slot? On this I, had one. One, I had a con I had one question now. I think it was one of your almost to the beginning of the, one of the, the, uh, the by percentage function. by. Oh, way at the beginning. The yes. Oh, okay. By function. So, so here's why I asked the question. You said state average budget is X amount of dollars, correct? Mm -hmm. So the average budget as a percentage, the students would help me understand those numbers. Because you see, since you have central administration, that's pretty much fixed, mm -hmm. right? No. Yeah. No. What was the difference? Because our district is considerably more efficient than another district. Okay, and that's a component of it. That's a component of it. But let me let me let me well, make a point. It's a huge component. Okay, let me make a point. So if you have 50 people. Well, I, I think what you're getting to is we're able able to leverage our size yes. as compared to a smaller district. We're able to That's leverage exactly our size. That's exactly so That's scale for sure. Okay, yeah. so that, that was the point I was trying to make. Yeah. Um, and so I guess what I'm getting at, that, that number is alarmingly low mm -hmm. relative to our, to our size because if we are continue to add students and our budget is getting bigger and bigger, I guess my concern, and if Dr. Stockton's comfortable with it, then I am, of course, is you know, it's, it's just pretty much his lead that we don't have enough support staff or, or my concern is that we're running lean, too lean, almost too lean here. Um, and I make the analogy, and I, I know it may sound funny, I continue to wash clothes at the house, and my wife tells me, stop washing, because no one's there to fold them, right? Because I don't want to fold them. So, so I take, I take that, that analogy, and as we add kids and our budget gets bigger, someone has to be there to fold them. Fold them. Yes. See, and that was my concern. That was my only concern. But if Dr. Stockton is comfortable that there's someone there, quote unquote, fold them, then it's what it is. I think what you made a very good point. Um, larger districts tend to be more towards our numbers than smaller districts. You know, we're, we're the what the 14th largest district. When you look at districts like Sci Fair and us and some other districts, um, they are much closer to those numbers than say some of the smaller districts. Because it really is apples to oranges when you look at that. Um, when, when you cost per student, smaller districts, your costs are much more per student than larger districts. So if we were to do, if we had information just on the largest 20 districts, it would be much more similar to us. Um, we, we still run a, a very lean and efficient operation, and I'm very proud of that. Um, but we do a needs assessment every year of things that we need, and if we need them, we bring them forward. I'm sorry. Years ago, I mean, we, we've seen ebb and flow in, 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 in central administration. And, and I remember when, in, when we did my, uh, as, as they retired or left or whatever, we didn't refill positions and we, and we maneuvered within and we shrank some. And then the, the very next year when the budget wasn't so bad, mm -hmm. I believe somebody made the comment, are we gonna replace those positions? And you said, Absolutely not. I mean, we're, we're not into replacing positions. We're into having the positions we need. And we have become more efficient through various different means. And one way is, did, don't we push, one way we got the 62.79, don't we push some of the effort that other districts might keep in the central office to the campus level in coaches and other things? And, and all that counts towards campus ins instruction support, does it not? Yes. I so, like think that. I mean, you know, I, I, just, I just think that that's where the, the difference in 
800 kids and 900 kids at an elementary matters at the campus level. Uh, right. You're just as worried about that additional 100 kids, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't change your daily workload. Not as much. Uh, per se. I mean, right. uh, it's not the same impact. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Darren. Oh, you're welcome. Back on my slides. So now, after uh, the proposed budget, we want to look at uh, our fund balance analysis, where we feel we'll be at the end of 2015-2016. And that budget is proposed at 416.6 million dollars. And our objective is to maintain an unassigned fund balance <coughs> to 24 percent of the annual budget which is, again, approximately two months, uh, two to three months of expenses. 16% of the budget, 66.7 million. 24% of the budget is 100 million. Our estimated unassigned fund balance at 831.16 is $135.4 million, which is 32.5% of the budget and $35.4 million over our high-end target. And we always feel it's prudent to do a pro forma for the 16-17 budget. Our, our beginning revenue, once again, is $441.3 million. Our estimated revenue change, based on 6% AV growth, $17.6 million. Our state funding with $1,400 growth, and due to the Robin Hood plan of our 12 or 10% growth this year, that change is going to result in a $27.4 million decrease for a total revenue decrease of $9.8 million, giving us total revenue available of $431.5 million. Our beginning expenditures, $416.6 million. Total estimated expenditures, $21.72 million. I, have, I, I did revisit that and up some of the, some of the uh, expenditures there. Giving us total expenditures of $438.32 million, uh, leaving us with a shortfall of $6.82 million. I'm sorry, could you go back? Yes, sir. Let's try and make sure. We're coming in closer to a 5%. Expense yeah, a little increase. Bit, a little bit closer. Okay. So we're adding another half a million dollars to the health insurance fund as well, mm -hmm. over what was originally. Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now our 2015-2016 budget summary: uh, payroll, 88.7 payroll and benefits, 88.7 percent of our budget. Contracted yeah. services, 5.6 percent of our budget. The largest piece of that is utilities. Uh, so supplies and materials, 4.3% of our budget. The largest item in there is fuel. Equipment and other is 1.4% of the budget. And the largest item in there is our insurance. So our proposed 2015-2016 budget is $416,662,226. Our 2015-2016 proposed tax rate is the same as it was last year, the dollar twenty-eight, and that dollar twenty-eight is still forty-eight cents lower than where where we were in 0506, and that tax rate was a dollar seventy-six. So what's next? Uh, finalized revenue. Uh, state legislature still waiting on the final numbers on the homestead uh, calculation. Local assessed value. Uh, we should be receiving certified values by the end of this week, by the twenty-fifth. Uh, we have public hearings and budget approval, uh, public hearing on the 4th and 18th, and then final budget approval will come to the board on August 18th. Excellent. Thank you, Darren. Any questions, Mr. Rice? Mr. Rice, before we well, Yeah, I just have a quick question. Huh. Just kind of grasping it, we've been operating about 22, 23 surplus mm -hmm. in 24 this year, and then, but you guys are doing a great job and conservatively looking at down the road, we're going to have a little bit of a deficit. So we may not be able to use some of that surplus like we did before for the construction projects. So I know that's a case, a year by year analysis, but is the goal then to kind of keep some in the kitty for the anticipated? Well, yeah, yeah. Each year you have to anticipate that with the Robin Hood plan. You have to you have to look forward and see what how that decrease is going to affect you. So so it is. But we're fine because like this year you're like eight or nine percent. Better than last year, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. Now, if our property values come in at ten or twelve percent, that shortfall will, will, will go away. 
So, but we have to be prepared. Yeah. Thank you. Well, those property values will come down. Yeah. At some yeah. point. When? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Rice, appreciate your efforts again. Awesome, awesome presentation. I, item 6D, approve 2015-16 teacher hiring schedule and other employee raises. Dr. Stock. All right, and please invite Mr. Cox to the podium to present this item for your approval. President Husbands, members of the board, Dr. Stockton, I recommend the Board of Trustees approve the 2015-2016 teacher hiring schedule and employee raises that were included in the presentation you just looked at. Uh, CISD administration believes that early approval of the teacher hiring schedule and raises will uh, improve recruitment and retention. Uh, the proposal was recommended by the TASB Compensation Group. It represents a 3% general pay increase on the midpoint. Administration believes that this proposal will keep CISD competitive with its, low, with its peer districts in the Houston area. Uh, and under this plan, the <clears throat> starting teacher salary, as Mr. Rice indicated, will be $50,000. And existing teachers will receive a salary increase all t existing teachers will receive a salary increase of $1,625 or more next year. So I recommend that you approve this proposal. Mr. President, I move we approve the teacher hiring schedule and other employee raises. Second. Second. Any discussion, questions? Mr. No, sir. All those in, uh, in favor signify by raising your right hand. All opposed like sign. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stockton, for, uh, and, and Mr. Rice, Thank you, Dr. Uh, Cox. and Mr. Mr. Cox, and everybody else for coming with a great proposal to support our teachers. And yeah. We're 100% in favor. Well, thank you. For, thank you, the school board. <laughs> <laughs> financial reports. All right, I'll ask Mr. Rice come back to the podium. <laughs> well, I, I, would, I would entertain that just a hearing last year's budget and having already seen the month, monthly numbers that we would uh, dispense with the reading of those numbers, but that's up to anybody else. Anybody have an objection to that? He prepared. Good, Mr. Rice, you take the night off. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have an executive section. And um, uh, item 9... Uh, a, except for review, the TASB local policy update 102. I'll turn that over to Mrs. Gladys. Thank you, Dr. Stockton. You've had 102 for a while and the very helpful yellow vantage points that explains um, the changes to this particular uh, update brings to us. The two major um, areas, <coughs> are Section C, which doesn't really affect local policies a lot, but the legal policies. TASB has rewritten um, all the legal policies with the help of Bond Council to make sure that all of the current laws and regulations are reflected in the legal policies, which is particularly important right now. Um, also, the D series has been reorganized a little bit. It's been, some of the policies have been broken up, uh, apart um, to make it uh, easier to, to locate information. I think it's very helpful. And then the other um, change that was very helpful in D series is the drug testing policy was reordered so that it's clear, more clear what federal requirements are and what local requirements are for drivers of district-owned vehicles. Um, administration has reviewed all of the local policies that were contained in Update 102, and they are recommending the changes that were um, included in your packet, and we'll be bringing those back to you in August and asking for your adoption of the local policies in that update. So have anybody have any questions of Ms. Gladys tonight? I have one question regarding the alcohol and drug testing. Yes. It, if I read it correctly, it said for employees subject to the DOT testing, which would be our bus drivers, right. the added text explains that the <laughs> district has the option of permitting an employee to return to work after a failed drug or alcohol test if the employee follows protocols required by the rules. We do not do that here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That is an Good interesting question. answer. We talked about that earlier. Thank you. Correct answer. <laughs> I move approval. It has been moved. We're not. We don't. We're not. We don't have to next, do anything. Next no, it's for review tonight. Perfect. Well, we uh, there. There's one uh, a very uh, just housekeeping issue. Uh, you know, because uh, and, and it's not an agenda item, but uh, tonight. Uh, 
And Ms. Ferris is last night as our board secretary. Yeah. And we would like to, as a board, recognize you as a, a great member of the team, mm -hmm. uh, someone that we couldn't do without, someone I know that Dr. Stockton will miss dearly, even though he has able and, and willing support uh, uh, in, in hand. But we want to thank you for years and years of service to this board and to Dr. Stockton. And uh, I'd appreciate everybody joining me in, in, a, in an appreciation. <laughs> now I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion adjourn. Motion. Second. Second. All those in favor, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here, everybody. Great job, Don. I gather the end of next year we're going to have four over what we would want to get on hand. Yes, it's going to be a million. Yes, it's my best. Yes. Yes. They got to have a super screen. They got to have a super screen. That's going to drive that number. And I'm not counting the efficiency. It's going to bulk up at the human features of the dead earth. It's going to be a lot of money. 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 So, so that number is okay. to my point was that's what I was seeing and confirmation. Oh, oh, I already oh, knew it. I was thinking it was back there for me. Yes, ma'am. Because <laughs> <laughs> he wants right. to run away. And so you're going to have the majority of the districts are. Drop it. No. Here, gone. I know. Before you know it. Can we tell you